the Center for Innovative Technology, and Mach 37, Virginia Cyber Accelerator, present Uniting Women in Cyber, Leadership, Innovation, Inclusion. Thank you all for being here. And I'm just going to do a quick intro about myself and our firm as a sponsor. So I'm Stephanie Evans. I'm a partner at Wilmer Hill. Um, we do a lot with cyber technology, emerging growth companies, and we're just delighted to be a sponsor. Um, I'm also a member of the advisory board for the symposium. So it's been a wonderful day. I, I know that you all are really excited about the day as well. So um, I wanted to introduce um, Liza Mundy. Uh, we're thrilled to hear from her. She's a New York Times best-selling author. She's a journalist, a former staff writer for the Washington Post. Her career has included the publication of many books and a number of award-winning works. Her most recent work and the subject of her keynote address this evening is Code Girls. And it brings to life the story of several exemplary women laborers during the height of World War II. Kept secret due to military orders, the scientific accomplishments of these women code breakers were almost written out of history until Liza discovered their stories and uncovered the tales of young and courageous women breaking German and Japanese code that ultimately helped the US win the Second World War. The surviving code girls, now in their 90s, serve as an inspiration to our goal of promoting women in science and tech industries. So um, Liza will come up in um, one second. The other thing I wanted to do is to introduce Teresa Shea from Incutel and Sabra Horn from DHS. Both of them were also at the NSA, and after Liza speaks, um, they will be offering some thoughts, and also um, feel free if anybody has questions to please ask. And so with that, let me um, welcome Liza. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. It's always daunting to compete with a cocktail hour or to know that the <laughs> cocktail hour is not very far away. Uh, so I will um, try to bring out my best anecdotes and keep you entertained while you're thinking about whether you want red or white. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so during the past three years, I've spent a lot of time with women in their mid-90s. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of interviews in assisted living facilities. I've eaten a lot of tuna fish and cottage cheese and uh, saltine crackers and butternut squash soup. Uh, and, um, and, and, and about four years ago, exactly, I was sitting in my first of these interviews in an assisted living facility in Midlothian, outside Richmond, Virginia, trying to convince a woman named Dot Braden Bruce that she wouldn't be put in prison if she finally told me what she did during World War II. Uh, and it took a lot of convincing, uh, because when, the, when Dot and thousands of other young women arrived in Washington during World War II, uh, often not knowing what was the work that they had signed up for, one of the things that they were told was that they would be shot if they told anybody what they were doing. They had to sign a secrecy oath, uh, and, and it was true, because it was wartime to talk about their secret code-breaking work was in fact treason, and the penalty for treason at the time was death. Uh, so it took me about a half an hour to convince Dot that it was finally okay to talk. Uh, seated with me was her son, Jim Bruce, who knew that his mother did something important during World War II, uh, and, and really for all of his adult life, had, uh, had, had wanted to find out more about what she did. So uh, it took, Dot toyed with us for about 30 minutes uh, until you know, I, I finally said, well, you know, if they do put you in prison, it would probably be a nice prison at your age. Uh, and, and that sort of relaxed her. <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, and so she started unspooling for the next couple hours this extraordinary tale of being a young school teacher in Chatham, Virginia, which is not that far away from where I grew up in Roanoke. Uh, she had grown up in Lynchburg, Virginia. She was the oldest daughter in a family of four children. She had a single mom who was supporting the family as a secretary at a uniform factory in Lynchburg. Uh, and, and her mother had 
had wanted her to go to college at a time when only 4% of American women got a four-year college degree because there were so few jobs available for educated women back then. Uh, it was 1942, women were largely shut out of medical school, law school, architecture, engineering, uh, the sciences. They were pretty much professionally not open to women. The only, the only job that women could count on who were well-educated was teaching school, and, at that, and only if they were single. When women got married back then, uh, they were expected to stop working, to stay home. Uh, and so Dot had gone to Randolph-Macon Women's College in Lynchburg because her mother felt that she might have a better life or get a slightly better job uh, than she had because her mother had not had the benefit of college. Uh, and so it was a very hectic year, her first school teaching year in Chatham. World War II had started and, uh, and all the male teachers had immediately left for the fighting. So uh, she was saddled with teaching English, French, physics, Latin, you name it, uh, something called hygiene. Uh, and she was completely exhausted by that. So when she went home for the summer, her mother told her, well, there's some war recruiters. There's some recruiters at the Virginia Hotel recruiting for some sort of secret work. Why don't you get out and see what, she, what they want? Uh, what Dot didn't know is that she was entering into this incredible narrative that, uh, that taking place in the US government was this massive effort to ramp up our ability to intercept signals that were being used by the Japanese, the Germans, different signal systems every day all over the world, thousands and thousands of messages sent every day just the way we send texts and Instagrams and emails all day long, uh, encrypted often. Uh, the, Jer the Japanese, the Germans, the British, us, we were all sending these messages. We were always seeking different ways to encode and encipher our messages that were going out over the radio waves, being sent by Morse code, very, very public means of sending communications. Uh, and so, all of the men that the military normally would have recruited to learn how to do this work were suddenly unavailable because we were in a total global war and all the men were fighting. So the US government decided for the first time, and I literally found a memo uh, in which a government official had written new source women's colleges. They had decided for the first time that if the men they would they would prefer to have do this work were unavailable, they would give these college-educated women a chance to do something other than teach school. What Dot also didn't know is that the US Army and the US Navy had competing code-breaking operations, and they were desperately competing for these women. And the strategy that the Army hit upon, and I literally found oral histories in which commanding officers congratulated themselves on this, they felt that, um, that the best way to lure a young school teacher to do secret government work was to send its handsomest young army officers to lurk <laughs> in hotels and post offices all around the South in particular uh, was the district that the army was confined to because they believed that, that Southern women in particular was acceptable to the charms of a handsome man <laughs> and that these women not knowing what they were coming to Washington to do would come to Washington with the hope of making a marriage uh, to a man who looked like their recruiting officer. But Dot, at 23, was very typical of the young women who answered this call in the sense that she was trying to get out of a marriage that she didn't want to enter into. Her college boyfriend was in training camp. He had sent her a ring uh, hoping to get engaged. He wanted her to follow him to training camp in California. Women were told at the time that it was their job to keep up soldier morale, so she felt like she had to wear the ring, even though she didn't want to get married. So here, lo and behold, standing behind the recruitment table was an excuse not to have to get married uh, to, to this guy and to, and to you know, follow a completely different path uh, than the one six months earlier that she would have thought she'd be following. Um, her other inducements were she had two younger brothers who were already in the fighting. Uh, families were so patriotic during World War II that everybody wanted to contribute anything they could to the war effort. Families were donating in pots and pans. People were picking up rubber bands off the street to donate to the war effort. Uh, the Braden family had actually tried to donate their dog, Poochie, to the war effort, and Dot still has a single space letter that she received from the Army War Dog Training Center uh, saying that they had a, an age cap uh, for their war dogs and that Poochie was too old. Uh, <laughs> but Dot was not. 
Uh, and so she, uh, she took the train. The other inducement to come to Washington was that she had grown up during the Depression like all these women. She had never traveled. She had never seen Washington, D.C., even though it was uh, just three hours away from Lynchburg. So she got on the train without having any idea what she was going to be doing. Uh, she didn't realize also that at the same time, the U.S. Navy was competing for code-breaking women who would uh, tackle the Japanese Naval Fleet Code as well as the German Enigma site that was being used by the Germans to control and command their U-boats uh, that were everywhere in the Atlantic Ocean. And the Navy had a different technique for this recruitment. It targeted elite women's colleges in the Northeast, schools like Smith and Radcliffe and Bryn Mawr. And those women would be called in. They would be identified by their math and astronomy professors. They were called in one by one for secret meetings. They were asked two questions. Do you like crossword puzzles? And are you engaged to be married? So you can see that marriage was a big theme. It was sort of an obsession of the military who was recruiting these women. Uh, and if those young women answered yes to the first, they liked crossword puzzles, and no, they were not engaged to be married, then those women were invited to take secret correspondence courses for their senior year uh, in order to learn the arcane field of cryptanalysis, which, of course, none of them had ever heard of. Often their instructors had never heard of it either, and most of their instructors were about a chapter ahead in the Navy's training material as the Women studied this arcane field, learned how to take frequency counts, learned the behavior of letters in English, learned the behavior of women, uh, letters in French, learned the behavior of letters in Romanized Japanese, which is what Japanese diplomats were using to communicate back with Tokyo. And all of these women would converge on Washington. They had been competed for uh, by these agencies you know, that were making assumptions about them as women, assumptions about their, uh, about their capabilities. It was believed on one hand that women were better at sort of of low-level, careful work that took a lot of concentration but didn't take great flights of genius. Uh, but it was also believed that women uh, potentially couldn't keep a secret. And so the military was a little bit nervous about recruiting these women to come do this top secret work. Uh, but all the women, when they came to Washington, were told, were reminded that it was wartime, were told that if, they, uh, that if they talked about what they did, the penalty would be death. They shouldn't expect, just because they were women, uh, that they wouldn't suffer the, uh, the ultimate penalty for talking about this work. They were so terrified of speaking uh, that um, they, were, they were told to tell people that they were secretaries, that if anybody asked what they were doing, they were to say that they filled inkwells or they emptied trash cans or they sharpened pencils. Uh, and so that's what Dot Braden and all these other women would tell people. And the irony is because they were women, people believed that. So at the time, they were the ideal intelligence officers in the sense that people readily believed that the work they were doing must be trivial and couldn't be important. But in fact, you know, ultimately, our code-breaking operation was larger than that of the British. It was bigger than Bletchley Park, and more than half of our code-breaking force was female. It was ex-school teachers. It was uh, recently graduated college seniors. It was brilliant young women who had strived to get a college education at a time when there were so many barriers and discouragements. Uh, the US Army had a civilian code-breaking operation. Uh, it was located at a place called Arlington Hall that still exists. It's where the State Department trains its foreign service officers. Uh, the Navy had a compound on, uh, on Nebraska Avenue, which is where Homeland Security is now. Both of those had been schools for young women. Uh, they kicked the girls out in both cases. Uh, the, the women in Washington had to take classes at Garfinkel's department store uh, while they tried to find a place to study, and they brought in all these women code breakers. There was also an African-American unit in the Army civilian operation, again, mostly school teachers, women who had, uh, who had overcome even greater barriers in order to attain college uh, educations in a segregated school system and who had also been recruited to work in a top secret unit. And that unit was working the codes and ciphers of the private sector. And of course, uh, that's what many of you are involved with now. This was essentially cybersecurity back then. Companies and banks encrypted their communications as best they could uh, then as they do now. And that particular unit was working the, uh, the ciphers of banks and businesses to see who was doing business with Hitler or who was doing business with Japanese companies like Mitsubishi. Uh, so that was very important work as well. 
Uh, Dot Braden, my central character, it still boggles her mind and she still has a hard time believing that she was part of one of the most important code-breaking successes of World War II, uh, which was the code system that was being used by the supply ships that were supplying the Japanese army, which was spread out all over the Pacific Ocean. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had captured Guam, they had captured the Philippines, they had captured all these islands and land masses, uh, and they were sending signals every day to the supply ships that had to bring them everything that they needed, uh, food, fuel, medicine, spare parts, reinforcement troops, all of these messages were being sent out every day as these ships plied the Pacific. And it was Dot and thousands of other former school teachers who were working that supply ship code. It was called 2468, uh, or the water transport code. It was a massive assembly line of former, uh, former school teachers. Uh, and, and one of the, um, to me, one of the uh, wonderful anecdotes that Dot told was about what it was like to, to come to Washington to work with this enormous group of, of well-educated women, uh, but also to be in a workplace for the first time. So they were doing incredibly important work. They had to work very fast. These messages had to be sent to American submarine commanders who would be waiting then on the horizon when the Japanese ships appeared, and they would sink them. We sank thousands of ships. Uh, but but they had the annoyance of having to work with people they didn't necessarily like. Uh, in government conditions, it was very, very hot in the huge facility where they worked. And they had to work with women from different parts of the country. So the Southern school teachers came up from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia. Uh, but there were also women recruited by the Army from places like Russell Sage, Wheaton College, Connecticut College. And one of the things that Dot remembered in our first conversation was a woman named Miriam, who she described as the most condescending northerner she had ever met. Uh, there was a stigma against the southern women in the facility that the thinking was that they weren't as well educated uh, from women from other, as women from other parts of the country. So, um, so Dot remembered that Miriam would, uh, would, over lunch in the cafeteria, would say things like, I've never yet met a southerner who can speak proper English. Uh, and Dot found that irritating, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> And, and there were also men in the code-breaking facility, literary men from high circles in New York City who were too old for the fighting, but who came to Washington to help. And one of them referred to the Southern women as the jewels. And the reason he said that was because he thought that uh, so many Southern women were named Ruby and Opal and Pearl and Emerald. <laughs> And when I was doing my research for Code Girls, I spent a lot of time in the files in, uh, in, the, in the college, in the archives, at National Archives at College Park. And I have to admit, as a Southerner myself, that there were a lot of women named Ruby and Opal and Pearl. And there were also a number of jewels, women who were actually named Jewel. And one of the women I interviewed, who is still alive, uh, was recruited out of Winthrop College in South Carolina. Her name is Jewel. And uh, she was a high school band director when she was recruited to come to the code breaking operation. Uh, and uh, musical ability was also a marker for code-breaking talent uh, during the war because it involves the ability to follow patterns. So all of these women came together. They got on each other's nerves during the course of the day working in you know, massive uh, temporary buildings, again, that were very hot, working with paper messages. They had to do a lot of math in their head. Uh, they, were, they were working with a four-digit code system in which a word like maru or supply ship would be rendered as a, a, f a set of four numbers, 6281, say, uh, and then another set of numbers would be added to it, which was called enciphering. It was an early version of a encryption. And it was Dot's job to, uh, to look at these messages, to try to strip out in her head the encryption, and, um, and, then, and then get the message as far as she could along, and then take it to this annoying woman from New York City, uh, Miriam, who was what she called the overlapper. And it was Miriam's job to stack up the messages and, uh, and try to tease out certain stereotyped words so they could figure out what certain code groups stood for. Uh, and, and when Dot was sort of the first time I talked to her, when she was recalling this for me, she said the word overlapper, and she clapped her hand to her mouth because she... Uh, not only had she never talked about the work that she did during the war, uh, but she had never uttered certain words like overlapper outside the compound where she was working. The women were told not only never to talk about their work, even after the war, even after we won, thanks to their efforts, thanks in, par in, in part to their efforts, uh, but 
she never used certain words because these were terms of art. The women were told if you say something like security, or if you say overlapper, uh, if you say obviously cryptanalysis, you'll, you, you might say it on the streets of Washington and somebody from the Axis might overhear you. Uh, and so it was so hard for her to utter that word that uh, again, she clapped her hand over her mouth and, and couldn't believe that she had said the word overlapper. Uh, so. 11,000 women came to Washington from all over the United States. Uh, the women naval code breakers would be admitted into the waves. They would become actual members of the military. Uh, at that point, women who enlisted in the US Navy who hadn't gone to college could, um, could, could be routed into the code breaking facility simply by dint of their intelligence and their aptitude. So women from all over the country came to do this work. Uh, they were remarkably adept at keeping the secret uh, and, and kept it for really for the rest of their lives and in most cases took it to their graves. Uh, and so for Dot, just to give you a sense of how hard it was and how annoying it was, both of her brothers fortunately survived the war. Both of them had jobs after the war that involved top secret security clearances. Uh, and it was a very competitive family of siblings, very bright uh, young people. And they would get together and brag about the fact that they had top secret security clearances. Uh, and Dot could never tell them that she also had a top secret security clearance. Uh, and she essentially kept that, uh, kept that secret for decades and decades. And when I was reporting my book, I interviewed her younger brother, Titi. Uh, and he admitted that even late in life when she started intimating that she had had something to do with codes, uh, they just assumed that it was a little job, uh, that it wasn't very important. And I think you know historians writing about wartime code breaking certainly committed the same uh, injustice toward these women. Because I found when I went to the National Archives that there were thousands of files thousands of files of wartime code breaking, uh, and that there were women's names all through these files. Uh, and, and really, they had been neglected and overlooked by historians writing about wartime code breaking. Uh, the women had been released from their oath of secrecy back in the 1980s and 90s, but nobody had tracked them down to tell them. Uh, so again, in many cases, <laughs> You know, I had to convince them that, uh, that it was OK to finally talk about, about what they did. Um, and since the book has been published, I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people who said, you know, I knew my mother did something during the war, and my grandmother did something during the war, but she always said she was a secretary. Uh, and, and, and so many people have come to realize what the women and their families contributed to American history. Uh, and, and after publication, I was fortunate to be on a panel with Margaret Lee Shetterly, who wrote Hidden Figures, who wrote the book, and then which became a wonderful movie about the African American women mathematicians. And she made a great point. She said, you know, women have been working in rooms, working hard in rooms of American history for decades and decades. You know, World War II was when cybersecurity was born. It was when so much of our STEM innovation was pioneered, often by women. Uh, and, and Margot Lee Shetterly said, you know, finally people are coming along, and it's like we're turning on the light switches, and we're finding that there have been these women in, in American history all along, and, and now finally the rooms are illuminated out because we just didn't know that they were there. Uh, and I know that in the field of cyber security, there are ongoing conversations. Why aren't there more women in cybersecurity? Uh, you know, why is the field sometimes hostile to women or women at least feel outnumbered? And it's important to remember that women pioneered this field. This was early cyber intelligence. One of the women recruited from Russell Sage, Anne Kara Christie, who broke an incredibly important Japanese army code at 22, would go on to become the first female deputy director of the NSA. Uh, which arose out of our wartime code-breaking operations. So it was incredibly exciting, despite all the tuna salad that I did eat, uh, to, um, to, to get to talk to these women about their contributions, to substantiate it with a paper record, uh, and to, um, to hear women say things like, I, I just hope that I live long enough to see your book published so that they could finally get credit for the work that they, they did. Uh, the woman who said that, I was interviewing her in an emergency room in Atlanta because she had broken her wrist the night before. Um, but for, I, I learned that emergency rooms are very good places to interview people because they can't leave and they have to wait, <laughs> wait a long time. Uh, but I'm happy to say that she did live long enough to get credit for her work and I was very happy to be part of, of bringing this really massive effort uh, made by women uh, to uh, to win the war and and to assure that the that the that the right side won. Thanks. All right. Um, I'm Sabra Horn. 
I am Director of Stakeholder Engagement for Cybersecurity Resilience at DHS. I've been there since September, but I had the great honor of being at NSA from 2013 until September. And uh, Liza, I just wanted to say it was a fascinating book that you wrote. Um, I hope you Thanks. all will take the opportunity to read it because the stories really are so very compelling. What really struck me, both with your words just now and also your book, is how very difficult it was for women to be part of this journey, what adversities they faced in, in getting to NSA, what they had to deal with while they were there, and then to be relegated to a relatively small uh, footnote in the chapter of history, which is simply not the case. I would say that I think it is difficult to have some of these careers, but it is absolutely the most rewarding work you could ever possibly imagine. I too faced a lot of adversity in getting to NSA. I actually did not even come to government until I was 40 years old. I was also a woman, and I also did not have a technical background, so a, a, a lot of uh, strikes against me. But um, with hard work, uh, you can overcome basically anything, and I, I think that there's been a lot of acceptance for these days how women can bring a level of humanity and resilience and fortitude to these roles, and it's absolutely critical in both at NSA as well as all of our intelligence agencies that we have those capabilities. So I didn't get to NSA until I was actually 48. Um, I had an incredibly fascinating journey while I was there. I actually came one week after Edward Snowden released his thousands of classified documents, and I was able to join a small group of people who worked on that effort. I will say it was during that time uh, when I was asked to uh, talk to the workforce about the impact of how that release had affected them um, individually as well as the organization. That was when I came to fall in love with the people at NSA and I realized how very critical they were, not only to our national security, but how very committed they were to the work. They were incredibly inspiring people, and it was a true honor to get to work with them. So I would just say to you, it's impossible to look at the folks in this audience here and to say, um, please, if you are interested in any way in this work, please try to make your way to NSA. It is a remarkable place filled with remarkable people, the most intelligent pe intelligence people I've ever met in my life. And I think we have an opportunity here, those of you that bring cyber expertise, um, there is so much important work to be done, and I would just ask for you to do something on behalf of your country, in addition to all the incredible work that you're doing here today. I also wanted to make sure that Teresa had a moment to chat, and I know she won't say this about herself, but she's one of the most um, important people that has come from NSA, and while I worked there, um, you were the third ranking at the entire agency, and it was such an incredible honor to work with you, but how much you've accomplished in that time. Okay, thanks, Sabra. You guys met me, uh, <laughs> met me earlier, and I want to give my time back to Liza. I want her to tell us about the movie. I'm like, yeah, go movie. So, <laughs> if you can't imagine how we as the, the women at NSA felt when this book finally got released and these stories came out. It was, it was just so, it, it, we, we just are so appreciative to you, Liza, for doing that hard grunt work, you know, you, as you said, thousands and thousands of files that nobody had really ever researched. So thank you. Thank, thank you, and you know, and so I asked her backstage, I said, how many books will you sign for me? Because, <laughs> because I have so many people that I want to share this story with because it really is the same story today as it was then for those women. We can't talk about it. Intelligence tells you secrets, secrets that can be emotionally draining, very, very difficult to break, but you know you make a difference when you deliver intelligence in a timely and actionable manner. And it's just how you describe those women. And Ann Cara Christie, who for us was, you know, like the super superhero. I mean, she was retired really by the time that we were there, but I did get to know her and meet her. But I still learned so much in the book about her 
that I didn't know even from knowing her personally. And I told Liza when we first had an opportunity to meet and chat that, um, you know, Ann Cara Christie still does not, I mean, she did not get the credit at NSA for a long, long time that she, sh that she should have gotten. And uh, so thank you, thank you. And tell us about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, thank you for saying that. It means a lot to me, you know, to know that, that, that people were reading the book and, you know, looking forward to its publication. And, and I would also say uh, props to Ann Cara Christie. She is the most non-condescending uh, person and, and self-deprecating person, uh, which may be one reason she didn't get the credit that she deserved. Uh, when I interviewed her, one of the hard things about interviewing for this book was that normally I would have tried to spend all my time with the paper records first and read a lot of books first and know what I was talking about a little bit in the interviews. But because the women were in their mid-90s, I had to get to them as soon as I could. I had basically an actuarial deadline in, in addition to the, the book <laughs> deadline. And, uh, and, and in fact, you know, Ann Cara Christie died. I interviewed her five times, but she died while I was reporting the book. And so I had to get to them first. And, uh, and I was, when I look back at my transcript, it is so mortifying the questions I was asking her. I, I just didn't know anything. And, and she was so non-condescending, you know, for somebody as accomplished and formidable uh, as, as she was. And I, I you know, I, I heard later uh, from some men who worked with her that they thought she was scary. Uh, but at home, she had a great sense of humor. Uh, and she never, if she was amused by the basic level of the questions I was asking, uh, she, she did not give it away. So, um, you know, I'd love to see her be played uh, in the movie. Um, if there is one. It has been optioned uh, by uh, the production company that's owned by Jim Parsons, who plays a NASA engineer in Hidden Figures. You might know him from Big Bang Theory. Uh, and and, and uh, they have a screenwriter, and the actress Margot Robbie, who plays Sonya Harding, is signed on to co-produce, so maybe she'll want to be in it. But, but I know that there's a lot of um, hurdles that have, to be, uh, that have to be crossed before uh, something that's been optioned actually ends up. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm keeping my expectations very realistic, I think. Well, it's exciting, very exciting. And we wanted to open it up to any of you, if you had any questions for Eliza. <laughs> um, I guess uh, uh, the head of a major studio, a really well-financed major. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the, the Academy Awards and Emmys are now full of women saying, you know, Reese Witherspoon saying, we want women-fronted narratives, and, you know, we need to get these stories about women out. They're incredibly commercially successful, right? Uh, you know, uh, Big Little Lies or Hidden Figures or whatever. So, like, okay, here you go. Here's a woman-fronted narrative. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> we will all have to put that on our to-do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let me make sure we do it in the mind for us. They can't get the recording, so questions will be... So how long total did it take you to complete the project, including the research and the writing, et cetera? Uh, and the editing uh, yeah. and the fact checking. Yeah. <laughs> and all uh, that. Uh, three years, which felt like one year too little. I, I mean, I could have used uh, another year, I felt like, but, um, but you always could. And at a certain point, it's time's up, pencils down, right? Uh, so um, it was, yeah, it was a lot of time logged in the National Archives and... Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, how did you like learn about this story and this topic and get interested in it? So as you know, or as you, may, as you all know, uh, our federal agencies have great historians often working for them. The NSA has a wonderful history office. And I, I read a declassified internal history of the Venona Project, which was the small Russian code, our, our project during the war to break Russian codes, which we weren't supposed to be doing, but we did. Uh, and, uh, and, and that internal history that had, you know, it, at a certain point only been available to people in the NSA, it had been declassified, and it mentioned that there were a lot of women working on this project during the war, and a lot of them were former school teachers, including from the part of Virginia that I'm from, southwestern Virginia, and I thought, that's bizarre. Uh, so I went out to uh, the cryptologic museum that's attached to NSA and talked to a wonderful historian, Betsy Smoot, 
and, uh, and a wonderful curator at the museum, Jennifer Wilcox, uh, and of course, obviously both women. Uh, Jennifer had curated an exhibit at the museum on women in cryptology, and it was though they had been waiting for somebody to come along who wanted to tell this story, and they laid out the much larger story of, of Japanese and German code breaking. The Russian project was very small at that point, uh, so there was a much bigger story, and, um, and they were both, you know, as helpful as they could be uh, in, in, in bringing the book to fruition. And I think, it, again, it's like hidden figures. People at NASA knew their origin story. They knew that African-American women had been helped pioneer the space race, and it really took somebody like Margaret Shutterly to come in and say, okay, I want to tell this story. Uh, and uh, anyway, so that's, that's the origin story of Code Girls. So I wanted to, to thank everybody. Um, and Liza, Sabra, Teresa, it was absolutely wonderful having you all up here. And I know it, um, the next thing is to have some cocktails. And I know that Tiffany and Giovanna will be kicking that off right outside. And of course, if you have any other questions, Liza will be around as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.